Deuteronomy chapter 9. Um, go, moving through the book of Deuteronomy, I'm going to switch over to my head. Which he issues with, with it, but okay, good, we're good. Uh, Deuteronomy 9, and uh, just a reminder, one of the main themes that we're wrestling with, uh, and we will... N- with all, with, all the, with all our wrestling and heavy lifting in a book like Deuteronomy, we will never fully grasp the, the tension. We will never fully um, reconcile the tension between, between God's sovereignty, that he is over all, in all, through all, doing all things for the purpose of his will, all things grand and all things small. He maintains, and yet our responsibility we have a part in it. And you hear it even at the very beginning of chapter 9 when it talks about what God is doing and he's going to do. And then he says, now go do it. Okay? You'll hear that. But listen to chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. This is the word of God. Here, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard, it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now, pausing there, if you remember from Aaron's passage last week, uh, he said that God said, you know, I'm giving you this land, I'm going to give you these, I'm going to have you dispossess the people that are there in the land. Um, But it's not because of your population. It's not because of your power. It's not because of your population. In other words, it's not you. It's not about you. Okay? Well, he's going to say add to that. He's, he's, He's reminding them of that. He's pointing to that here with the sons of Anak who are big and powerful and populated. Verse 3. Know therefore today that he who goes over before you As a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. God's sovereignty, his work. He's going to do this. Now, their responsibility. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Verse 4. Do not say in your heart. Now, this is the challenge. This is the exhortation. Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Verse 6, know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. Okay, If there's any question, this should clarify, right? That should make it clear. Like, there's no, what is he talking about here? But then he goes on. For you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath. And the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. When I, this is Moses speaking, went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord made with you, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone and the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly 
out of the way that I commanded. They have made themselves a metal image. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that your word uh, stands forever. Lord, the flowers fade and the grass withers, but your word stands forever. It's something we can trust in. But Lord, we need your spirit to, to hear it, to understand it. So would you give us, open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, speak through me. I know to this week, uh, you know, a busy week in Birmingham, Alabama, and I feel like I didn't have the adequate time to prepare. And so, Lord, would you speak what you intend through your word, um, your truth. In your name we pray, amen. amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, I went with uh, Marcus Whitman, one of our elders this past week, to uh, Birmingham, Alabama for the super exciting general assembly of our denomination, the gathering of elders and pastors, etc., from all over the country, even from other countries that visited uh, 2,000 some of us to, uh, to, to, to discuss our denomination and to pray and to worship, but really to dig into the weeds of how to best protect the peace and purity of the church. Where, where is Marcus? I don't see it. There, hey, Marcus. It was a seven-hour trip. We had a good time. Marcus prepared in advance a series of podcasts uh, for our entertainment and really for my education. Uh, the, uh, the focus of, of, of numerous hours of these uh, were on the subject of social in engineering. And I won't go into detail of what that is, but it's something akin to people manipulation. And, uh, and then how that combines with modern technology. Uh, that is, I was shocked at the amount of technology that's available to people engaged in, in uh, s basically spying and people manipulation. We'll just boil it down. Is that fair, Marcus? Something along those lines. So uh, anyway, it got me thinking, co combined with GA, that this could be uh, beneficial toward, to the church, a skill that could be beneficial to the church, and even for us, Midtown, as we seek a building, it could be um, profitable for us because I had an idea, and when I got back, I began to work on this idea, what if we could use these skills, technology and social engagement, to, for, the, for the peace and purity of the church, for better, greater, more accurate discipleship. And what I came up with, and I'm not a technician, so it's a bit, it's, I'll say it's, a, it's, a, a, it's in its rudimentary form. This is the prototype. It's called an avillameter. Everybody say avillameter. So you see, do you see that dot there, right there? Okay, avillameter. I think there's a, uh, Sarah, there's a, uh, yeah, the avillameter. <laughs> and how it works is this. You take the avillimeter and you can point it at somebody, right? And it, it will find the nearest electronical device on that person, maybe a, a cell phone, a laptop, and read their information, read their data, and we know that's possible. And Built into it is an algorithm by which it reads quickly through all their social engagements and all their searches and all their purchases. And it can determine through searching through certain words and conversations their exact level of sanctification. <laughs> okay? So as I shine it, say on Aaron here, and then you look at the, it gives me a number, 26.5 on a scale of 100. 100 being very evil. We would say, that's pretty good. And then we could shine it over at Paul Linscott. There. 39.5. So anyway, we could go on and on. I won't embarrass anybody else here. But I thought, how valuable would this be in church discipleship? Because uh, as, as, as we're discerning how people may need to grow, we can just, we don't need, we don't have awkward conversations. Not, no need for that. No need for coffee and, and questions and perusing or sharing. No, we, don't, we don't even need to, matter of fact, we don't even need community groups, really. We just show up maybe once a week and just Pastor Mark, Aaron, get a little you know, 
49.2, uh, come on, brother, come on, Chad, you know, come on, what's going on? <laughs> Step it up. We don't need to interview people for church membership. Matter of fact, we could give, Aaron and I could have one at the communion table. And as people come, we just, no, not, not today, maybe next week. Okay. <laughs> now, why do I bring this up? The reason I bring this up, because while, yes, this doesn't exist yet in reality, there is a tendency within all of us to assess our own righteousness, and that's good and proper and right. We need to examine our own hearts. It even says, examine one another before you take communion. We need to assess among ourselves. That's proper and right. But in that, there is a temptation because we're human and it's somehow the way that we're built. I don't know why. We assess our righteousness by comparing it to that of others. We are naturally bent towards comparison. And when we compare, we want to assess how does that, how does that relate to our affections from God? It's the same thing that happens oftentimes with children. You have some children who, in their desire to gain the affections of their parents, will put their best self forward, knowing that if they can just be better than their brother or sister, that their parents will be more approving of them, more loved. Well, we do the same thing with God. And Moses, or I should say God, knows this pitfall for the Israelites even before they go into the land that he has given them. He knows that there is going to be a temptation for them to think, look at those evil people. Look at those Canaanites. Look what they're doing. And they know what's going on. And to think, we're righteous. God is on our side. God looks down with great affection upon us because of who we are. Don't do this. Israel, don't do this, evangelical church. Don't do this, Midtown church. What I want to do, I want us to go into this passage, unpack it a little bit, and I want to do it this way. I want us to go back. I want us to put our, this is important when we're studying scripture and I'm preparing, when I prepare a sermon or a teaching, I'll try to enter back into the context that it was, these words were given in order to better understand, and then bring the text forward into the context that we are in now. And so I want to invite us to go back into the context of these first words, and then we're going to come back and out and go back to the future, if you will, to bring it into our context. And in order to do two things, one, to have a better and more proper assessment of this exhortation, and then also to have a better and more proper action in light of this event. So first of all, going back, proper assessment. Let's go back, and I want to invite you to go back into this time period. What's going on? Israel is gathered before the Jordan River, about to cross over into the land that he has provided for them, and they're getting a little exhortative uh, talking to, right? They're getting a talking to by Moses. He's pointing back to the days that led up to this event. He's pointing back to what happened in Egypt, that God redeemed them out of Egypt. God chose them out of Egypt, saved them, heard their cries, brought them out, and declared that they would be his nation for his worship. Times were hard in Egypt, and yet God loved them, and he brought them out. And since then, and he brought them to the new land, right? And what happened is they were about to go into the new land, a group of them, 12, went and they saw that there were giants in the land, 10 of them came back and said, no, we're, no, 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 we're, this is going to be, we're going to lose this battle, this is not good, no. Two said, we can do this because God is on our side. The people listened to the 10 and they said, no, we're not going. And so God had them 40 years in the wilderness and now they've been walking around nomads in the desert, uh, passing through and often having skirmishes with other nations, other tribes, and seeing them with their houses and their farms and their, uh, you know, all the things that are part of being civilized society, and, but they're called to be nomads, to take down their tents, put them up, take them down, put them up, pray for enough water and enough food, God providing manna from heaven, birds from heaven, 
And God provides. And now he's saying to them, now the time of nomad is over. Go, take the land, take it. Matter of fact, I'm going to go before you and I will dispossess the people who are there, but you're going to be part of that. Take possession. Here's the land. Here's the reward that you have been waiting for. Hallelujah. It's a day of rejoicing. And God has called them to evict the current landholders. He's looked at the people that are there. God knows their hearts. He's seen their actions. And he said, you are going to evict these people. And that's hard. This is hard stuff. We've talked about it a little bit because he's going to tell them to destroy them all, to remove them from this planet. Why? Because they are wicked. And if you, I won't go through this, but if at some point I would encourage you to read Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 goes into some detail into uh, for some of the reasons that these people are being evicted. There are things like this. Sleeping with your sister. Sleeping with your mother. Sleeping with your children. Sleeping with your animals. Giving your children as an offering to their God, Molech, profaning the name of your God. And then he says this, after a long litany of all the things, some that are unspeakable, he says this to the Israelites in verse 24 of Leviticus 18, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these nations, for, what, for by all these, these things that he just listed out, nations, driving out before you have become unclean and the land became unclean so that I am punished so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants so he's given reason there why is he removing them because of their wickedness and so Moses here does it go into the details of that, but he tells them, why are they removing you? No, it's not because of your righteousness. And Moses' speak is getting a little bit long and hit this point, and I can imagine there may be some guys there that are like, okay, you know, we get it, we get it, let's go, let's go, let's go. We got our swords, we're ready, we're, we're ready to take the land, we're ready to enjoy the fruit of this land, we're ready to, to take out those infidels, to get rid of those wicked pagans, get them out. We read Leviticus 18. We read it last night. It's horrible. And then Moses is added this. It's not because you are righteous that I am giving you the land. Wait, well, but, but Leviticus 18. Moses, did it, didn't you hear the horrible things that they are doing? Like, we're not doing stuff like that. It's not because of your righteousness. Because you're a stubborn-hearted people. You have experienced the, the beauty and the bounty of a wonderful God who redeemed you from Egypt, who could have destroyed you on numerous occasions and was inclined to do that, but He preserved you and extended to you so much love and mercy and promise for the future. And you spit in His face over and over again. You're a stubborn-hearted people, a word that is used to describe an animal that when you pull on it with a rope to get it to go somewhere, it just will not budge. It's obstinate. That is you, Israel. But they're, you, you, but they're wicked. Maybe, okay, so maybe, maybe we're a little less wicked? It doesn't say that. What it says is, it's not because of your righteousness. It's because of their wickedness. And because of the promise that was made to your fathers. In other words, it has nothing to do with anything about you and your works. But it's because of Him and His mercy and His grace and His compassion to a wayward people. That's the message that they needed to hear. Would they listen to it? Not for long. Romans chapter 3, 
Verse 23 says this, For all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. That's Israel's situation, and that's our situation. That's every human situation. We are all unrighteous. We are all wicked. Even the best works that we present to God as filthy rags. See, what would happen is that God's people would bring, before they would go to war, oftentimes they would bring gifts to, to the God, or to God, Yahweh, but, but in other religions as well. Uh, reli- uh, religious tribes and nations with their gods, they would make sacrifices to their God in order to gain favor before they go to battle. And in ancient times, and I think sometimes even now, warfare was the very arbiter of moral justice. In other words, they would equate military victory and power with moral superiority. Whoever wins, well, this shows it. God's more favorable to them. Why is God favorable? Because they're more righteous. And Israel, having been deeply dipped in the culture of Egypt, that's part of their thinking as well. We're going to win this. God is giving us. He's already told us we're going to win because we're morally superior. No. And then Isaiah 64, much later, would say this, and it's even repeated later in Romans. The best things that you bring, in other words, those sacrifices that you bring before God to win His favor, filthy rags. Filthy rags. Sometimes when I'm uh, playing soccer, I'll have a big bag of soccer accoutrements that I love. And I'll be done, come home, or before I come home, I'll take off my jersey and throw it in the bag. It gets buried down in there. And when I come home, I'll forget to take it out. And it just lays in that bag, festering uh, and, and growing who knows what kind of funguses and molds and and Alice, at some point over days, maybe weeks later, will walk by uh, the room and I'll hear, what is that smell? <laughs> and I'll have to go hunting around down in there and inevitably I'll find the culprit. A dirty, stinky, filthy rag. And that's what the Bible says. That is when we are trying to earn God's favor, when we are beginning to believe that somehow something we can do will gain His favor, gain His, uh, His, His approval or Him being on our side, those things are gain, let's just say it, gain righteousness. Those things, whatever we may bring, you know, helping out at the homeless shelter, protesting against abortion, being a faithful husband, being a good student, making straight A's, being a, uh, all those things which are good. When it comes to earning the favor of God, gaining His pleasure, they are filthy rags. So what does this mean for uh, us at that time, if we were going back in history? What does it mean for Israel as if we were a part of Israel? As we go into the land, as we prepare to take and remove these people, do the hard work, humbling work of removing these wicked people, we have to go in not with an attitude of self-righteousness, not with an attitude of, hey, God's on our side, but rather we are recipients of God's mercy. We are the hand of God as a tool of judgment upon a wicked people of whom we have received mercy and grace. But by the grace of God also go we. We are no better. We have had grace extended to us while we were an enemy of God. We are invited to the king's table to enjoy the the bounty of his provision. Not as knights in shining armor, but as dirty thieves in filthy garments who are there in the first place to steal from His kingdom. And He knows that and He welcomes us in and He says, your sins are forgiven. We can't bribe our way. We can't bribe God to be on our side. 
And rather, he invites us into his side by his grace. Second, now I want to invite us, or actually maybe we'll do this. I want to invite Moses and company. So maybe Moses and Joshua, Caleb, maybe a few others, to come forward. Bring, them, bring this story into, his, into uh, present time. And I'll start by saying, you know, there has been a temptation in my heart over the last few days to gloat. There has been a temptation, as I've seen people post online, friends of mine who have posted and said, hey, what about, what about those children who are going to be born in poverty, uncared for? And it's been tempting me over to say, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how about we kill them, and that will solve the problem. To be sarcastic. Is there truth in that? Do I want to say that? Yes. To gloat, to put forth my self righteousness. God is on our side. God is for the Republicans. God is for what we're doing. God is for the PCA. Because we're righteous. Rather than recognizing that God is not for us, He is for Himself. And He invites us to join in to his plan, his agenda, his righteousness. Moses and company now coming forward, traveling through history. They make a stop, 36 AD, and they're in a court like this, maybe a lot like this, a little bigger. And there's a man uh, there being interrogated, and Asking for him to defend himself. You're not sure exactly what's going on, but there are people surrounding him. They're upset. They're making accusations. Something about what he believes. He's a Jew, but they're all Jews here, it would seem. And that man is making a defense, and he's talking about the history of Israel. And all of a sudden, Moses realized, looks over at Joshua, they're talking about us. Listen, he's talking about what, where we just were. And he says, he's talking about them, us, we, us, God's people, Israelite being still stiff neck. That's just what I said. And this man, Stephen, is saying they were a stiff-necked people. They rejected God over and over, and yet God was faithful to them. And then he gets to verse 51. Or then he hears Stephen say, and was recorded in Acts chapter 7, Verse 51, he says this, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. He's talking about Moses' people as your fathers did. So do you. And Moses looks around at Stephen, giving these brazen words to these people around him. And he realizes they're Jews, and not only that, in talking and hearing them, he realized they're law keepers. They are the ones who are defending and upholding the law that Moses gave them. So how is it that this man is now condemning them? He's trying to figure that out. The context is different. And he realizes that the context, while being very different, the problem is the same because these people here condemning this man, they have assessed their own selves. They have looked at their righteousness and they have seen that they are in God's favor so they believe because of their righteousness. Rather than rejecting the law, they have taken the law and snatched it out of God's hand and used it as a badge of their righteousness and even so much that they've added new laws over and over and over again. The context is different, but the problem is the same. They have found righteousness in themselves that they believe has earned God's favor and rejected the notion of grace. Curious. But before he can weigh in, and he's tempted to do so, fast forward, 2022. Again, another different radical context. Very different. They're kind of in shock. They're looking around. Bread uh, from heaven has now turned to bread on every street corner. Matter of fact, these horseless carriages are able to drive up and drop off bread and, and delicious delicacies at people's homes. And you, you, could, you could go to any number of buildings and get uh, bread and birds. 
No, and, and water from a rock, every home has a shiny rock with water. Matter of fact, multiple flowing water freely everywhere. And instead of tablets of stone to guide them and direct them, they have tablets of stone that they, in their pockets that they pull out and glow and give them guidance and direction. So very different circumstances. But there's something very similar. Evil still abounds. But here's what's different also is that rather than the followers of Yahweh being sequestered away as a separate tribe or nation, they're scattered throughout all the land. They just seem to be everywhere, nook and in, 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 incorporated into the community. Good, God's people and those who have rejected God all intermingled among one another. It's not a theonomic nation. But he notices as he visits churches, as he has conversations, as he watches these glowing tablets, he notices that there's something that is similar. And that is that so many of the followers of Yahweh believe that their righteousness is what has earned them God's favor. Their good works has, in comparison with the wickedness around them, that they are on higher moral ground and that God looks down and says, that's good, I choose you and remove the others. Why? Because of your goodness, your rightness. And the followers of Yahweh are quick to point that out and quick to wag their fingers at others. Quick to believe that God is on our side. That we win because of our righteousness. Moses has realized that the words that he spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 10 were true in 36 AD and also in 2022 AD. What's changed? What's changed? Something's changed. Something's different. God's grace is the same. It was there in Deuteronomy. It was there in Acts chapter 7. And it's here now. That's the same. God's mercy, God's grace, that He saves us because He is compassionate and loving to His people and faithful to His promises but not because we are righteous and they are wicked. But the righteousness that we are given by God is not because of the law that Moses brought. Something's different. And he picks up a Bible in his uh, hotel room where he finds it. He starts reading through it and he comes to the book of Hebrews and is talking about his law, going on and on about his law, that God gave him. But something's different, and he comes to chapter 3, and he sees his name here, and it says this, Therefore, brothers, holy brothers, chapter 3, verse 1, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Hmm, what's up with this Jesus person? Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He's connected to the confession and the covenant of the Old Testament, a priest. who was faithful to him who appointed him. Just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Verse 3, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now Moses is really intrigued. Who is this man Jesus? And why is he counted as more glorious, more worthy? So he keeps reading. And he comes to chapter 8, where it describes in more about Jesus and these promises and something that has changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Verse 3, for every high priest, so he's talking about the priest again, Jesus, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, that's the law that Moses set in place by God's direction, 
Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Yeah, yeah, that sounds familiar. Verse 4, now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is far more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted in better promises. In other words, something has changed, and it is this person, Jesus, no longer Moses, and the law of Moses. It's different. It's more glorious. It's even better. What is it? He keeps reading. Chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have come into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, what? You mean anybody can go into the holy place? Anyone can enter in before the throne of God because of the blood of a man named Jesus? By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. What in the world? And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, draw near to God. But, but when, when, when I was back in the, remember in the wilderness, I had to tell everybody, go far back, go away, back up, get far away. God can't be near you, you stubborn hearted people. You're not welcome. You couldn't even handle it. And now he's told, hey, you can draw near. Felicity, you can draw near. Alice, you can draw near. Jenny, you can draw near. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what the evilometer says about you. You can draw near to the throne of God. Why? Because your heart has been given full assurance of faith. Our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of what He has done. So while there's a temptation for us all, like Israel, some things are the same. 36 AD, 4000 BC, 2022, the temptation of God's people is still the same. To look at the world around us and think, I'm glad I'm not wicked like them, and that God looked down and saw me and said, wow, that's awesome. What a great guy. What a great gal. I choose you. I'm on your side. Our response to that has got to be, Father, forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry for my self-righteousness. Something is the same, but also something is different. And I'll close with Ephesians chapter 2. What do we do? What is the proper response? What is the proper action when we recognize our own hearts, when we assess and we realize it's not because of our righteousness that we have been saved, right? It's not because of our righteousness that we are any better than anybody else. Our validity, our identity, our deepest satisfaction is not because of our comparison with others. Stop comparing. Repent of comparison. And look to Christ, the author and finisher of your faith, and then do what? What are we called to do? Here's the odd thing. Good works. Now go do good works. Not because you're earning God's favor, but because he has shown you his favor through Jesus. That's what Ephesians 2 says, and I'll close with this. For by grace you have been saved, Midtown Church, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, what's next? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are called to be salt. We are called to be light. We are called to be not destroyers or destructive of the world around us, that wicked, wicked world, but rather we are called to live in truth 
and in righteousness with them and before them for the transformation, not the destruction of God's kingdom. May he do this through us. Father, we thank you that by your grace we have been saved. Lord, help us to think properly as we assess ourselves, not to despair, but to point us to your cross, to your love for us through Jesus, and then to invigorate our hands and our feet and our mouths, our tongues, our gifts, to make this world more like you and to point those who are lost and confused and hurt like sheep without a shepherd to point them to our king. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I invite you now uh, all to gather.